Hi there, and welcome back to Good Distinctions. I'm your host, Will Wright, and Good Distinctions are the spice of life. Today, I'm joined by my friend, Ramy Leroy. Ramy, welcome. Thank you. Wonderful to be here with you, as always. It, it's wonderful to have you here. So just a little bit of background for those listening. Uh, Ramy and I met at the Institute of Catholic Theology, uh, studying for our master's degrees in theology at Franciscan University. Uh, Ramy, I think you're pretty close to done, aren't you? I am. I actually just took the final exam of my final class on Saturday, and I just have to take a Congrats. comprehensive exam, and then I'll be done. Yeah. <laughs> the comps are the comps are so simple, so easy. No, actually, that was a beast. But you'll be great. It'll yes. be awesome. <laughs> I'll help you study later. Well, well, All right. So to relax before I get anxiety about that. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on from that, um, I invited Ramy on today to talk about. New Age. Uh, she works in Sedona, Arizona. If you haven't been there, it's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And it also happens to be what I call the Mecca of the New Age movement uh, in 2023, uh, almost 2024. There's nowhere else that I can think of in this hemisphere uh, that is more attuned to New Age thought, practice, and just sort of being present. You you drive down the street, walk down the street, and there's new age stores, entire stores. Oh yeah, not just one, but multiple. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the Red Rocks have a certain power and aura. Anyway, um, we're not going to get into that yet, but we will get into that. Um, but I guess I'll just start with this. I'll start with a comment, and then you can sort of take it from there. So maybe this is going to be a little bit controversial, but. Oh, well, we at Good Distinctions are all about making good distinctions uh, because they are the spice of life. But this one might be a little bit on the nose and maybe not as much of a good distinction as me just trying to be a bit of a troll. So here we go. I think philosophically speaking, technically speaking, Buddhism may in fact be further from Christianity than Satanism. Ramy. <laughs> Uh, what do you think about that? A great first Crazy question. controversial comment. Yeah, first <laughs> comment of the podcast. Yeah, well, actually, I, I could see why you would say something like that. Um, because at least in Satanism, they're recognizing Christ. There's a recognition of Christianity. Uh, maybe it's a, a negative or opposite recognition. I mean, in the Bible, the demons know who Christ is. Um mm -hmm. But in Buddhism, it's there is no recognition of Christianity, of Christ, or even of God. It's really all about self-emptying, non-attachment, becoming nothing. Um, so I could see how you could say a comment like that. Like it's not out of the realm. Of, <laughs> it's not super crazy, but um, yeah, you know, it's kind of you know, Christ says. Um, would you, you know, rather be hot or cold, uh, not lukewarm, you know? So I think it, it falls into that category of being, you know, cold, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I should, I should make a caveat here before anybody uh, tries to cancel me or sue me for defamation. I don't think Buddhism is is evil like Satanism is evil. I right. think it's a grave evil to worship Satan. However, I think there are some serious problems with Buddhism. So yeah. um, you've already mentioned a couple of those, this idea of self-emptying for, for what? I mean, what, what's mm -hmm. the end? What's the goal? Right. Yeah. And this is where, you know, I kind of got into trouble myself. Um, I was studying Buddhism um, and then got into yoga and kind of got all into the Eastern spirituality and the self emptying. Um, I was telling you before we started that, uh, when I was at a yoga studio, they had a challenge of 30 days of taking a yoga class. And then you would get a t-shirt that says surrender. And <laughs> I didn't think much of it at the time. I was like, yeah, surrender, you know, it's great. Uh, but looking back, I'm thinking, surrender to what? You know, when you surrender, you're surrendering to something. Um, every yoga class. Well, and surrender, surrender to who? Who? Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, every yoga class ends in corpse pose um, where, you know, you're just kind of melting into nothingness. And Buddhism is, is 
along the same lines of just this self emptying, you know, non attachment, which, you know, we know there can be good qualities to that. Like you were saying earlier, you know, mm -hmm. you, yeah, as Christians, we want to empty ourselves to fill ourselves and have a relationship. It's all about having a relationship with God, but that relationship isn't there with that. So you're just hmm. emptying and emptying and emptying and you're becoming nothing, um, which can be very dangerous. It feels good at first because you're just like, ah, oh, I'm letting go of all the stress, all the anxiety, all these burdens. Um, but then you're opening yourself up up to anything like really bad things um your human dignity is being emptied as well um and you may find hmm. yourself uh getting involved in things you know because well if nothing you know if you're nothing what does it matter you know you're just kind of just melts with the universe like you're just part of the universe like you know whatever um and then you can also it can lead you to a place of nihilism or even despair Whereas, you know, at first you're thinking, you know, this is great. Um, nothing matters. Like, I don't have to worry. Nothing matters. Nothing matters. And then eventually you're like, nothing matters. Like, so what's the point of anything? You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so it, it can be dangerous in a lot of different ways. And I know for myself, I got to a point where I was, I literally said to my parents over Christmas holiday, um, I don't, I don't know who I am anymore. It was kind of like, hmm. you know, and I hadn't become Catholic yet. I was in this middle place where I was realizing like something's wrong. Um, I've lost myself and I didn't even know what I meant by that. Like, I wasn't even sure what I meant exactly. I just knew like whoever I am was gone and I, I didn't know who I was anymore and it felt really dire, but I couldn't understand hmm. it completely. So looking back now, having many years to reflect on it and learning the truth of our faith, um, I kind I can see how damaging that self empty self emptying emptying can be. So when so you said it you described it as dire. <laughs> I mean I it seems like a fairly dramatic existential crisis. I is <laughs> was it a a sort of this uh, say more on that? Like, was it a feeling of being on a cliff, like looking into nothingness, or were you thinking, okay, I must be something, so I need to just find that? So was it like a frantic search, or was it feeling like you were slipping into the void? It felt like slipping into a void. Like I just hmm. felt kind of lost. And it was very strange, um, just to go a little bit into to my personal story at the time, uh, because at the time I had everything that you, the world tells you, you should want. You know, I had a really great job. I was working at 20th Century Fox. I worked in Nakatomi Plaza from the Die Hard movies. Like that was my office building. <laughs> uh, super cool. Nice. Uh, I was going to parties on the Fox back lot. You know, I was moving up the corporate ladder. I was in great shape, going to the gym all the time, you know. So it was just this really strange juxtaposition of, you know, I have everything that the world says I want. I'm moving up. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing all these things, but I feel like I don't know. I feel empty because I was emptying myself, yeah. right? But I'm like, I feel just completely lost. And I don't, I don't understand who I am. None of this seems to really matter, really, <laughs> you know? Um, and for me, I, I did, it felt very dire, it felt like an emergency. And I just was like, I just have to get out of here. Like I have to leave LA. Um, and mm. I gave my two week notice to leave with really no plan. Everyone thought I was completely out of my mind. Um, <laughs> cause I was like, all I could think because I, I, I wasn't Catholic. I didn't know anything about Christianity. Um, so I didn't really understand what the problem was. Um, but I was like, I just have to get closer to nature. That's all I could think of. I just have to get closer to nature mm -hmm. and get where it's quiet. Uh, because when I'm here and I have all these, you know, the flashy, LA Hollywood thing going on, I just knew I wasn't ever going to be able to figure out what was happening if I was there, you know? So, 
yeah, it was, I, it was a pretty dramatic move. Um, and everyone thought I was crazy, you know, <laughs> but God knew what he was doing. <laughs> He always does. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you said when you were when you're doing yoga and things like this and emptying yourself and sort of slipping into I think you said slipping into the universe, something like that. It it kind of reminded me of a sort of uh a, a pantheism, like this idea of nature being God. Um mm -hmm. was there any sort of notion of that or or were you like sort of just normally or naturally temperamentally attracted to nature? Was it, or was it just simply this reaction against the hustle and bustle of LA? I think it was more reaction against the LA okay. scene. I mean, LA was good to me and I'm not putting it down for sure, but it's very much, I mean, like, I, most... I'm happy to put it down. I'm very happy to put it down. <laughs> I hate LA. Uh, sorry, LA no, folks. No. <laughs> but you know, like, it's not most... my favorite place in the world. Sure. Yeah, I get it. I mean, like most cities and corporate lifestyle, um, you know, you do become detached. There is something, I mean, God, when you're in nature, when you're at the Grand Canyon, you're here in Sedona, you do feel closer to God because um, God created that. But when you're surrounded by buildings, <laughs> you know, you start to get a bit disconnected. Um, so I think I was picking up on that. Um, I was never like a nature, you know, um, hmm. okay. yeah, but it, it's all I could think to do, I guess. And I think just getting quiet, getting away from, I didn't, I knew I wasn't strong enough, <laughs> you know, being in LA, being there with all the, the fancy stuff I had and the, you know, I just knew if I, if I didn't get out of there, I was going to kind of get sucked into, into that and, and simultaneously like losing myself, if that makes hmm. sense. Um, so how did you settle on Sedona? <laughs> well, actually my folks moved here in oh, okay. 2008. Uh, so I was visiting them, you know, here on vacations and stuff like that. Uh, so, and Sedona is gorgeous, you know, so anybody who comes here, it I mean, it's hard not to fall in love with Sedona. So I, when I, got it in my head that I kind of, I wanted to get out of the city and go closer to nature. Um, it seemed to make sense because I had some familiarity with this place. I had family here. Um, so that was the main reason I came to this area and I don't regret it. It's, it is like living in paradise. It's gorgeous. <laughs> it is gorgeous. Well, and it's for anyone who's listening, who's not from Arizona, it's only two hours from Phoenix. It's yeah. an easy drive. Uh, so definitely come out and see it and come to, um, see the beautiful nature, but then also the, uh, the chapel in Sedona is also beautiful, but we'll, we'll yeah. get there in a moment. Cause I, I do want to talk about the chapel. Cause I just, I love it. I've been there multiple times and I just, it's one of those places where you feel close to God because he's literally there in the tabernacle, but then you look out the window and you see his creation and you're like, wow, this is cool. Have uh, you heard like the, the, the best of both worlds? Yeah, right. Like, have you heard the joke? Like, God made the Grand Canyon, but he lives in Sedona. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd believe it. That's, I, I mean, the Grand Canyon's cool, but Sedona, there is something special about that place. Yeah. Uh, it, it's so gorgeous. And it's not just the Red Rocks. I mean, it's the, the drive in, uh, driving through, driving from like Oak Creek up to Sedona. Um, yeah is one of my favorite parts. It's just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And you know, when I first moved here, so I was you get, all about the new yeah. age. I was all about, like, I was like, when I got here, I was like, oh, great. Now I'm really going to dive into my Buddhism, my yoga, my new age stuff. Yeah. What did that, what was that transition like? I mean, you obviously, like I said, when you drive down the street, you see everything right. Uh, I, not just the shops, but like the sides of the buildings, uh, advertise very clearly. This is a new oh. age place. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, like you said, almost on every corner, you're finding a crystal store, a new age store, a psychic, <laughs> whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And when I came here, you know, that was my main goal was to really dive into that world. And I did, I went to hmm. a meditation center here. I was going to the new age places all the time, practicing yoga 
um, going to Buddhist retreats, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I was doing that for about a year and I was kind of feeling like I was coming up. I mean, I was loved being here from the beginning for sure, just cause it was gorgeous. I was on the trails all the time and, and that was really <laughs> great. Um, but as far as my spirituality was going, it, it was kind of coming up empty. Um, and I actually hmm. was given the grace of a, of a bit of a mystical experience where I had a dream of Jesus um, that was kind of the catalyst, I guess, um, for my becoming interested in the Catholic Church. Um, I had this dream, and then over the next six months, um, Catholicism, Christianity was slipping into all these other things. Like I was listening to a Buddhist talk and he started talking about the serenity prayer. And I was reading a book about a Buddhist nun and she started talking about a CC. Um, and I'm like looking these things up, you know, listening to a new age <laughs> guru who brought up sin, you know, and I was like, Whoa, I've never heard anybody talk about this before. And so I always say, you know, Jesus was courting me, you know, um, and, uh, kind of slipping into these things and, and showing me the right, the way, the right way to go. And hmm. eventually I was like, maybe I should check out the, the Catholic church and, and the rest <laughs> is history. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that was my trajectory when I came here and, and God had other plans. So <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> If you don't mind going into it, what uh, what was that dream like? I mean, was it very, very clear to you that it was Jesus from the get go? Like, did he say, "Hi, it's, it's you know, it's me, it's Jesus"? Uh, we haven't yeah, really met, yeah. but hi. I usually don't go into it unless someone asks. So since you asked, um, yeah. So in the dream, well, first of all, when I when I woke up, I did instinctively know it was him, um, but I didn't really hmm. want to say it because I was like that was weird. <laughs> like why, why would Jesus come to me? I don't go to church. I don't pray. I don't do any of these things. So, um, I did know, and I didn't really, I kind of brushed it off. I was like, well, he obviously got lost, you know? Um, but in the dream, <laughs> I was standing in front of him and it was just very, I felt instantly at peace and very peaceful. And, and he said, Ooh. um, what do you say every day? And I was like, Oh, that's an interesting question. I wanted to answer it correctly. And I was doing affirmations at the time, you know, where you stand in front of a mirror and you say, all is well in my life, you know? So that's what I said. You know, I said, all is well in my life. And he said, well, which life? And I was like, what is that? What does that mean? Yeah. Huh. So then he gestured, um, to the side and I looked and there were all these feathers, sticking out of the ground. And he said, these are all the hearts beating on earth. And I remember thinking that's a lot of feathers, but it's not everybody. Um, and next thing I knew he was holding me and it felt like just, I felt very safe, like a little kid. Like it was just like a brother or father mm -hmm. holding me. And I saw a feather floating in the air and I started walking towards it and he said, go ahead. And I grabbed it and it had a ring on it and I stuck it on my finger and I woke up. Um, and I was like, whoa, that's wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty wild. That's and awesome. It was, it was amazing. Like, I mean, that was back in 2016 and I still to this, I mean, I just, it still blows my mind every time I think about it. Um, but it wasn't like, I mean, looking back, I'm like, gosh, I should have just right then and there, you know, became Christian, <laughs> you know, like, but it was kind of like, that's, you know, that's weird you know, why would that happen to me? Why would he come to me? And I, I told my mom and when I told my mom, I didn't say who it was. And she's like, that sounds like Jesus. You know? <laughs> and so it was, and, hmm. but I really didn't tell anyone else. And I just kind of went to my Buddhist stuff and continued on my way. And that's when it just kind of started slipping into everything. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm convinced, you know, no one else has to believe it. I don't care. I know it's real. I know he came to get me, <laughs> you know? I mean, um, that that's totally Jesus's MO. Like God <laughs> speaks to people in dreams all the time. Yes. It seems very, very clear to me. Um, 
I mean, I, I'm fully convinced that that was Jesus. There's no other, I mean, that's, that's as clear of a breakthrough of grace as you could possibly get. Yeah. But okay. So just, uh, from a skeptical standpoint, like Mm -hmm. playing devil's advocate, so to speak, was there anything before that, that sort of might have led to you thinking about Christianity or about Jesus? No. And that's, that's why it's so real to me because there's no, Mm -hmm. like if I dreamed of Jesus now, I'd be like, well, you know, all I do is I work at a church. I I pray. I watch movies. about Jesus. Like, I'd be like, yeah, of course, you know, I wouldn't think much of it. I'm telling you, I literally was doing nothing at all. Like that had anything to do with Jesus, anything to do with Christianity, wasn't going to church, wasn't praying, nothing. It wouldn't even have occurred to me to go to a church. In fact, it was, a, I mean, a bit of a turnoff at the time, you know? Right. Well, and it's not that you weren't, you weren't doing nothing. You were, you were absolutely doing something. You were doing yoga. You were going to Buddhist retreats. Yeah. You were steeped in that. And yet mm-hmm. uh, Jesus came to you in a way that you couldn't ignore. Yeah, and I even and though I, you tried for a little bit, I apparently. Even tried. Yeah, I even tried. That's yeah. what's, and and that's the thing is I you know I try to have that mindset too of just being a little skeptical, like okay, you know, yeah, maybe it was. But well, first of all, as Catholics, what do we we always look at the fruit? What's the fruit? I mean, mm-hmm. here I am finishing my master's in theology, working at a church now, like. <laughs> I'm part of the prayer and sacramental life and going to confession and, and all of it. Um, and however many years later. So that's definitely proof that something happened there. And then the fact that I wasn't doing anything that, you know, could have slipped into my subconscious to bring that about. And it's very looking back and, and like you said, it's, it's his MO, you know, even the questions like, asking questions and saying things that don't like at first you're like, wait, what? You know? And I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. The more I like, it's like, the more I think about it, the more I learn about our faith, the more I read scripture, the more it makes sense. And of course I was like a lot of people in the secular worlds where it was like, well, no, I mean, Jesus only goes to people who are perfect, who go to church. Mm. Like he wouldn't, I'm not a part of that group. You know, like he wouldn't come to me, but that's exactly what he does. Like, yeah, he does. He goes to the lost sheep, you know, like, and, you know, even though I was practicing things in total contradiction, I was genuinely searching um, Mm -hmm. and open. Uh, So, you know, I mean, St. Paul was literally killing Christians, you know? Um, Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's like looking for that heart that's, that's open Mm -hmm. and really, truly searching for the truth and, and, you know, or that relationship. And even if you don't know what you're searching for, and it's sad that in our world, our secular, our world's become so secular that it never even occurred to me to look there, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, to go to a church. I mean, I think I've told you this before in my conversion story. You know, I, when I did call the Catholic church, like I asked if I needed a ticket. I mean, I didn't even know, <laughs> like you could just go, you know? Um, so that's how like far gone I was, which makes the, it all the more legitimate to me, like that experience. Yeah. Well, it, it, well, it shows a few things. It shows that Clearly, Catholics, we have a lot of work to do on evangelization, on being more welcoming about going to where people are. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, this is one thing that was very clear to me when I worked in a parish was, why are we not going beyond our four walls to Mm -hmm. where people are who aren't coming, who aren't even looking at the Catholic Mm -hmm. Church? That's where we should be going. Uh, And really, that's what all of us and uh, all of us laity are called to. The clergy sanctifies the people, and then the people are supposed to go out mm-hmm. and sanctify the world. And in a lot of ways, that's not happening. And we definitely have a lot of room to improve, put it that way. But so wh- what did it look like? So you didn't have to get a ticket. You could actually just go to mass. <laughs> just go. Um, but then what are the next steps? What, what happened after? 
Well, I did. I went to mass. I sat in the very back, of course, and I had no clue what was going on. I felt like I had entered a foreign country or something. I mean, everybody was speaking hmm. English, but they might as well have not have been had not speaking English. I didn't understand really what was happening. Um, but hmm. I wanted to understand, like, because <laughs> I was like, some, I knew something was happening. I'm like, everybody's drinking out of the same <laughs> cup. Like, something's going on here. <laughs> you know? um, <laughs> so I went to the pastor after mass and said, listen, I don't know what's going on, but I want to understand what do I do? And unfortunately, he said, you know, just keep coming to mass. And he kind of just walked away. Um, and I said, well, that's not going to cut it because I don't understand what's happening. Like I need somebody, I always joke, like I was like in the book of acts where it's like, how do I know? Unless someone explains it, (laughs) you know? Um, so they didn't have an RCIA program there at the time. So I called another church nearby and thankfully they had a program. They had a woman teaching it who was wonderful, who became my mentor and we became fast friends. And um, I ended up going there. And then over time, you know, going to mass and going to the RCIA classes and hearing the gospel for the first time, I was just, I was blown away. I was like, why isn't everybody here? Like, this is all I've been searching for my whole life. I mean, you know, when I, the, what sticks out was when Jesus says, you know, do not be anxious about anything, you know? And it's like, well, that's what I was looking for, you know? Um, Things like that. I mean, when they, when they read the raising of Lazarus and I was just, I'm looking around like, did you guys just hear what they were talking about? Like, this is the most (laughs) amazing thing I've ever, I'm like, why isn't everybody, why isn't this place like busting at the seams with people here? I had never heard anything like that before. Um, And that was it. I was just, I knew like, this is what I've been looking for this whole time, you know? So yeah, it was, it was, I was given so many graces and I, I didn't deserve them. Of course, like I, I didn't do anything, you know, to, to get that, but that's what he does, you know? So <laughs> I was uh, listening to Father Josh Johnson uh, give a talk a few years ago, and he started the talk at the conference by saying, just to let you all know, you deserve hell. <laughs> and we're like, wow, thanks, Father. And he's <laughs> like, that's how he began it. But uh, he's like, but thankfully, Jesus redeemed you and you don't have to go there. And <laughs> it was a it was a nice you know, reality check. And sometimes yeah. my friend Chris and I occasionally will go, remember, you deserve hell. So yeah, be thankful. Right. <laughs> be grateful. Yeah. It, well, and it's in, it's interesting that you said that you uh, were receiving things that you had been looking for because it, back when in your dream, you mentioned that Jesus, you felt a sense of peace, mm-hmm. which is not nothing. It's not an emptiness. You're yeah. like Jesus says, I, I have a peace the world cannot give. Mm -hmm. And so you're receiving that peace and it took a while to unpack that. But again, it just highlights that with Jesus, we're not emptying ourselves for nothing. We're emptying ourselves for him to fill us with his peace and with his joy and to not be anxious. It's everything the world is looking for. um, And he's the only one who can give it. So exactly. it's, it's phenomenal to, to hear how he, uh, he worked in your life. And this was, I mean, um, this was not like some emotional sort of fling, right? Mm-hmm. This is, you, you were an adult at this point. Yeah. I was 38 years Just old like, when that happened. Yeah. So this is, this is not some sort of, um, you know, young fling of like, well, I'm just going to try this for a while. Yeah. Um, This was a a huge step. Yeah. I mean, this is when I came into the church or when I started going to mass and and starting to learn about our faith, I was like, this is it. Like, I don't know how not to give everything to this now. Like, I mean, like this is everything. This is all that really matters. Um, and I don't know Mm -hmm. how I can't have every single facet of my life somehow involved with Jesus, with the church. I mean, that just, 
It just and and it has been since. And it's it's interesting too, like you were saying, it's not just a flink because it doesn't feel good all the time. I mean, it's hard sometimes, you know. <laughs> no, um, no, it doesn't. It doesn't feel good all the time. Sometimes it's really freaking hard. Yeah. Um, so for those listening, yes, the Christian life is difficult, and that's okay. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and it's and we're so blessed to have the sacraments to to sustain us mm. and to because you know life is hard no matter what <laughs> and like you know it's it's going to be difficult so why wouldn't you have Jesus there with you i mean and you have confession i mean confessions become one of my favorite things ever you know i mean just to be able to get that peace um mm -hmm. uh, on a regular basis uh is just such a gift that he gave us and obviously the eucharist and but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it can be very hard sometimes and it's good. It's good to recall the beginning, the beginnings of my journey. Cause it, you know, it takes me, it reminds me of the, the wonder of it and not that I've lost the wonder of it, but mm. you know, you get the reality of the day to day. It's like, okay, you know, <laughs> now that you're in, I'm going to put you to work. <laughs> well, and you went straight from, uh, new age Buddhism, non-Christian, not baptized to not only Catholic, but the obvious next step of, I must get a master's in theology. Obviously. And then <laughs> <laughs> that's obviously the next step. But then you also are working at a parish and, you know, as someone yeah. who worked in a parish, you, you could be working for the best parish in the world, but nobody ever wants to see how the sausage is made. Right. It's it's yeah. a totally different thing to work in a parish day in and day out uh, because you have, you know, human beings with their messy lives mm -hmm. uh, converging constantly. Yeah. And it's not the professional world. It's not the business world. It's messy parish. It's basically families. It's families. It's a family say, of families. I feel like I've entered the family business you know, or something. <laughs> yeah. But I have to say, like, as since we're talking about, you know, kind of new age versus um, it's interesting because when you're in the, the new age worlds, uh, Buddhism, yoga, all that kind of stuff, uh, there isn't that relationship and hmm. there isn't that commit like relationships mean commitment and it means you're going to be you know, um, doing things sometimes maybe you don't want to do or maybe you're tired and and I noticed like when I was in that world, I didn't do anything I didn't want to do. <laughs> you know, I was mm. kind of like, I don't feel like doing it today. Okay. You know, and, and you turn that into like, that's a spiritual thing. Like, mm. you know, it's only if I feel like doing it and you know, I'm not feeling like doing it or, you know, and um, I was very much living a life like that. Um, and, you know, it may seem nice, but you're not really why are you here? You know what I mean? Like you're not really giving of yourself. Um, and therefore you're not really getting anything real back either. And that's the hmm. thing that, you know, you, when you, when you become a Christian, you're in a relationship, you're in a relationship with Christ first and foremost, but also all your Christian brothers and sisters. And there is like, you're giving of yourself. I mean, that's, we look at a crucifix, right? I mean, the ultimate of giving, of your life, you know, and, and that's what we're called to. Um, and it can be intimidating sometimes, and it can be uh, a temptation to go into that world of not having any commitment to anybody or anything. And, um, but once mm -hmm. again, that leads to then this nihilism, this nothing really matters. I don't really need to be there for anybody. Um, and you just kind of become lost. Like, it sounds like a good thing, but you end up becoming lost because we're built, you know, God, I always say God's law is never opposed to natural law. It is natural law. Like he made us, he knows what mm -hmm. we need mm -hmm. and we do need, we're human beings. Like we do need that relationship and that giving and, and receiving. And, um, and that's been, that's been something that's been pretty amazing, especially being in a parish because you're, you are, you're just giving in a really big way and to so many people yeah. and, um, and that can be hard sometimes and it can be amazing. And you're a father. I mean, that's like the ultimate, um, 
you know, and really, I think when we're thinking about being a Christian and, and we're thinking about God, it's that, that parental relation. I mean, we're his children mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of what we need to think about. Um, and in these other <laughs> philosophies or whatever you want to call them, like that's not there. It's just doing what feels good, you know? <laughs> Well, I hear a lot of people who are into sort of new age e things as a sort of umbrella term, um, talking about needing to like ground themselves, needing to, mm -hmm. or to find themselves. So a couple thoughts on, on those two things. So this idea of grounding yourself, you know, the, the, the Greek word hummus, uh, it means dirt means ground the soil and it's the same root word as humility. And so when you talk about God being our father, it's, it reminded me of how much work I need to do as a father. I mean, you brought that up and I thought, hmm, yeah, cause I have a lot of work to do. And it's, I think the biggest thing it is for me is humbling because mm -hmm. I'm trying to be the best father and husband I can be. And I fail so often. Um, but it, it, it's exactly that it's humbling, which is a good thing if I allow it to be when I embrace that and it, it leads me to self-knowledge and it leads me to ultimately to wisdom and holiness, um, God willing. I mean, that's the idea, but, uh, so I think that we can only find grounding when we see ourselves as we are before God. Yeah. But absolutely. this other idea of, of finding ourselves, I, th I want to get your thoughts on this because it seems like everyone I've talked to who's into crystals or, anything else they're trying to solve their various problems mm -hmm. using uh these sort of externals yeah uh, ultimately to to calm everything in their lives and find balance and ultimately find themselves as a as a unified whole but that's never going to work and it, it's it's f maddeningly frustrating to me um but I don't have the words. I don't know how to help people through that. And it seems like you have real world experience there. So, I yeah. mean, what, what do you say to people who are looking for themselves? I mean, I often, my only response is, well, keep, keep looking and maybe you'll find <laughs> yourself in the mirror, I guess. I don't know. Like what, where do you need to go to find yourself? But, but what would you actually say to someone who's especially really into like, crystals or chakras or auras or, or whatever else they might be looking yeah. for balance and wholeness. Yeah, it's tricky. You know, I always say we're in mission territory here. Cause as you said, you know, it's very new agey and you know, we're, mm. we're trying to bring the gospel to people and figuring out the best way to do that. Um, and I know as somebody who was on the other side that, um, there's certain things that will speak to people who are in that place. I always try to, I know it can be really easy to be cynical and uh, towards, towards people in that, in that area <laughs> or doing all of that stuff. But I try to look at them the way I was, you know, I like they're searching, they're searching. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what are the kinds of things for me that, you know, that brought me or, or opened my eyes or helped me see where the truth really was. And, you know, there, we have as Catholics, we just have a treasure trove. I mean, to, to pull from, I mean, the saints are just such a great way um, for mm. people to get into our faith. I mean, for, for me, like I said, I read a book about a Buddhist nun and she talked about Assisi. So, of course, now I'm looking up St. Francis of Assisi and I don't know how anybody could learn about St. Francis of Assisi and not totally fall in love with the guy, you know. Um, and the saints can help teach them, you know, a certain prayer. I mean, the serenity prayer really spoke to me um, and that was very helpful. Um, so I think as Catholics, we need to have like our tool chest of what are the kinds of things that are, I wouldn't open with certain scripture verses that are difficult. Not that, you know, of course they're important and we need to know them, but if some, you got to think of somebody who hasn't heard any of this and you're coming at them with like something really gnarly, you know, and they're kind of like, whoa, you know, it's 
I, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, that's, <laughs> I had that experience, you know, um, you know, Protestants are really more open about trying to get people in. And I, I remember having people coming up to me with these, I mean, now I would know the scripture verse, but back then I just sounded nuts. You know, I was like, what are you talking about? You know, so maybe you would open with, you know, do not be anxious, you know, or something like that rather <laughs> than, you know, some of the others. I think about that a lot because I handle the social media for the Chapel of the Holy Cross and St. John Vianney Catholic Church. And I'm very conscious about, you know, which saint quotes am I sharing to who, mm -hmm. like who, like I will purposefully find um, saint quotes for the chapel, for example, or scripture verses that that would touch somebody who maybe haven't hasn't even read scripture and they haven't even heard any of these things before but you know and beauty is we have so much beauty here i mean people come to the chapel and they're curious uh we have adoration and mass now at the chapel and you know they'll come in and, and they're like well what's going on here and i think as catholics we need to yeah, I know sometimes we're met with hostility, but we need to try to let down our guard and not assume that's what's happening at first, you know, and just mm -hmm. kind of explain it to people. Um, Cause I didn't know, I didn't know anything. Um, so it's an opportunity and not worry about just plant a seed, you know, <laughs> don't worry about mm -hmm. so much. Like, I have to get this person to understand this right now. Um, and it's tempting to be, you know, sometimes I can be a little, you know, harsh with, with a, you know, why are you holding <laughs> that crystal? It's not going to, that's just a rock. It's a pretty rock. You know, it's not going to help you. Um, but I, mean, also, I, do, I do that with my students at the yeah. high school. I mean, if they're wearing crystals, I'm like, you don't need that crap. It, I mean, it looks nice, but why are you wearing that? Um, and I, I've had some interesting conversations there, but but what you said about planting a seed um, reminded me of something. Do you Have you ever heard Deacon Harold Burke Severs speak? No, no. All right, well, look him up. He's amazing. He's, uh, okay. um, he's a deacon in uh, Oregon and just phenomenal. Very, very uh, strong, booming voice. Um, big black guy, like I, first time I saw him, I was like, man, this guy's like a Baptist preacher, um, but he's a Catholic deacon and he's just amazing. Um, uh, really good guy. But he has this one line where he says, you plant a seed and you walk away, you plant a seed <laughs> and you walk away. <laughs> it's like, yeah, exactly. Like, stop, stop messing around. Like just plant the seed, get out of there. It'll be okay. I, I definitely had uh, way more success in sharing the wonder and love I have about our faith than anything else. You never have, hmm. you never should compromise on the truth. Never, of course. Um, but it's pretty hard for people to, to get snappy with you. And you're just like, have you heard about this <laughs> awesome? Have you heard about our lady of Guadalupe? Like, come on. Like, that's the most amazing thing ever, you know? Um, because it is, you know, it's not that hard to, to get excited about these incredible things. And I mean, just like anything else in, in life, you go see a, a good movie, you have a good meal somewhere, you know, and you want to share it with people. Like, have you ever heard this? This is amazing. Have you ever heard about this saint? You know, have you heard St. Ignatius of Loyola got hit in, a, with, in the leg with a cannonball? Like, and then like, and then I had this huge conversion. I mean, these stories are un unbelievable, you know? Mm -hmm. So I definitely have found a lot more success doing that rather than condemning people or, or whatever, because I think most of the time they don't even realize what they're doing. I mean, that kind of stuff is seeped into mm -hmm. our culture so much. Like it just seems like normal to have a crystal shop or a Ouija board. I mean, like it's just, and they don't even know. I mean, but people do mm -hmm. get angry too. If you, I mean, the yoga topic can get really heated um, with some people, <laughs> you know, well, I'll, you I'll ask that question too. I, I have a lot of people that, uh, when I was at the parish would ask, well, is it okay if I'm, if I'm just doing it to, to stretch? And 
my response 99% of the time was basically you can stretch without doing yoga. <laughs> yeah. It's very possible. Uh, again, yeah, that, yeah. That, maybe that's a stupid answer, but it's like, no. why do you need yoga to stretch? Like I stretch and I don't do yoga and I haven't pulled anything exactly. recently. Um, so uh, how would, how would you respond to that? Because I, I think it is important to make a distinction between maybe some of the stretches that are part of mm -hmm. yoga practice, which are perfectly fine. Like there's nothing wrong with, um, doing downward dog or something like that, like in between stretching your back, like that's just a natural position for the human body. Right. But I mean, when you start getting into like how you're holding your body or especially like hand mudras or something like that, it mm -hmm. you're going somewhere else. Yeah. So wh wh where do you draw the line? Yeah. Yeah. Practically. <laughs> I, I say, I say what you say too. You know, I was a, I was a dancer for 25 years. And, um, so I stretched my whole life as, as a dancer. Um, and it was mm -hmm. very different than yoga, you know, yoga, there are mm -hmm. the positions, um, are very specific, very specific. Like you're, you know, I did yoga teacher training. So you, you learn like exactly where the, your hands are supposed to be exactly where your heels supposed to be. And, you know, and you're, you have to correct people to make sure they're in this very specific pose, um, which does have a background to it. Um, and I want to share a quote, actually, there's a really great interview between, um, it's on Pines with Aquinas with, uh, somebody named Alex Frank, and um, I'm going to steal his quote because I thought it was so great. Uh, he said, there's um, an objective quality, I wrote it down, to our actions that go beyond our subjective intent. Uh, so there's an objective hmm. quality to our actions that go beyond our subjective intent. So a lot of people say, mm -hmm. well, I'll go to a yoga class, but in my mind, I'm thinking about... <laughs> the Our Father, and I'm saying a Hail Mary, and it's like, nah, it doesn't really work that way. Like, you're still doing this very specific pose in a very specific way that was designed after something that was pretty nefarious, that has a history, and you can't, your mind, I mean, that quote kind of sums up a lot of the problems in our culture now. Like, well, if I, yeah. if I think, you know, like, you know, normally this means it, but if I think it's something different, then it's different. It's like, no, there's just some things they are, they just are what they are. And, you know, yeah, if you're... the object of an action is wrong, then the intent doesn't matter. The exactly. intent might give you more information, but it's not going <laughs> to, it might lessen your culpability, but it's not going to change the morality of the action. Exactly. I mean, so these poses were designed for, for certain reasons and you're, what you're thinking in your mind at the time isn't going to change that, you know? Um, can you, can you name some, an example or two of like, what are some of the backgrounds yeah. of these? I mean, I, I did, when I became Catholic, I kind of just wanted to get rid of a lot of that stuff out of my mind. <laughs> Fair um, enough. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, I do remember like warrior pose was based on an actual figure that killed all kinds of people and it was horrible um and it's like mm. i'm doing a pose after this this in, this individual or this figure that killed somebody you know i mean um so that's one i can remember off the top of my head but um but yeah a lot of it i was just like ugh, you know i don't i don't really want to even i used to know all this stuff mm. um but well, and it makes know. sense that we should be careful of that because we're we're body and soul, and so what we do with our bodies affects our soul and vice versa. Um, it's like you say. I mean, it, it something might seem innocuous; it might seem completely harmless. But I mean, how many people justify horrible actions by just saying, "Well, you know, I, I didn't mean it that way," right? Or or saying something incredibly hurtful and then saying, "Well, it was just a joke." It's like, well, you, you said it, you actually put it out there. <laughs> yeah. <there's, laughs> so there's, it doesn't really change the fact. Yeah. There's an objective reality here that, that we're dealing with. Um, and these, I mean, these pose yoga is very ancient as well. These poses do have a history and, mm -hmm. you know, I do think like it's come to our culture and it's kind of been marketed very well. 
Um, I would recommend that interview I mentioned because uh, he does go into all those all those details and what they mean and all of that. Um, but even when you're practicing it, you know, you do feel something's going on. And those poses, the physical poses are really just the beginning of the yoga. The yoga practice is really leading to getting into a meditation. The poses are just leading mm-hmm. you to get into meditation where once again, you're emptying yourself and all of that. Um, so they are preparing your body for something like something's going on there basically. And whether you Mm -hmm. and your mind are thinking something else, it doesn't really matter. And it can work on you without you really even understanding what's happening. And to me, you know, as a, as a Catholic, it's like, why would I even, I would even bother. Like I have everything, (laughs) I guess a Catholic, you have everything. Like, why would I even mess with that? Um, and I just say the same thing to people, just stretch, go to Pilates. Like, that's fine. (laughs) You know? Um, but yeah, if you like to stretch, just stretch, but there is this attachment, uh, that a a lot of people have, they get very emotional about it. Um, Mm. which to me does show that something more is happening there. Uh, (laughs) because I don't know too many, workouts where people get really emotional and angry when you say like, you know, it's not really a good idea to be doing this. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, there's, there's CrossFit, but that's just a bunch of bros that get really excited <laughs> about being bros at CrossFit. So yeah. <laughs> I, this is definitely different because CrossFit is not ancient. Like you said, yoga is ancient mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. and especially, um, like in uh, Indian culture specifically, like I brought up hand mudras, like I, I did dance for several years as well. And like we had learned about these different mudras and ways to hold your hands and they're oh. supposed to evoke these certain uh, changes in your body. Like you say, like it's getting you ready for something. It's manifesting something. Well, and scripture is very clear that the gods of the pagans are demons. Like this is not a metaphor. This is it's scripture. It's inerrant. It's something that's clearly being asserted by the author. And therefore I take it at face value that no, your elephant God or whomever is, is not just some nice caricature. Um, like I would even say, like, if you look at Greek and Roman um, pantheons and things like this, these are very clearly personifications of nature. Like they're not mm-hmm. personal, even if there are stories of mythological stories about this or that. Um, no one's actually worshiping these deities in the same way that you have in Hinduism. Like there's a true, like sacred reality um, that's spoken of. And it's, it's very clearly, it evokes to me anyway, from a historical perspective, a lot of those ancient religions um, that the Jews interacted with in scripture, which were very clearly worshiping demons. Yeah. um, Like, Moloch and um, by all and all the rest, like the demons love to trick us. And it's not always some sort of um, nefarious, spooky thing. It, it's these little subtle things to just, again, distract us from God and to pull us away from him. And I'm yeah. sure that if somebody's listening to this and they're thinking, oh, here the Catholics go again with seeing demons and everything. Like I love, uh, I love listening to Jimmy Aiken's mysterious world. And he always says, it's not always demons. It's not always aliens. And so I'll reiterate that here. It's not always demons, but in this case, it actually might be demons. Yeah. And I mean, really you look at these statues. I mean, cause here in Sedona, you just go to a restaurant and there's statues of these, hmm. whatever, you know, monkey thing, elephants, and they're, they are creepy looking, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's kind of like, we <laughs> kind of like, I don't know, like brainwashed to think what, what it's just normal that this, weird looking monkey elephant thing would be here. It's like, no, this is weird. This is weird. You guys like, (laughs) but I mean, I was in that too. I wasn't able to see, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd be in a yoga class and they would, we would like chant. I would chant. I don't even know what I was saying, but I mean, Mm -hmm. I was chanting stuff. That's kind of weird. You know, um, I didn't know what that was. (laughs) Or I, I went to a, a, a Buddhist retreat and they were pouring some liquid in our hands to drink. I didn't know what it was, you know, and it's like <laughs> we're kind of in this weird place where it's like, well, no, it's totally cool. It's fine. Whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. And 
sometimes it feels good. Um, but like I said to you before we started, like just because something feels good doesn't mean it is good. You know, like we have to think beyond that. We have to ask questions. You know, what does this mean? Uh, what are we mm -hmm. surrendering to? Uh, what's happening here? Um, and you would think we'll find it's it's not good. Um, and the Catholic faith has answers to everything. You know, a lot of people want to paint our faith as it's uh, some sort of mythological, you know, we're crazy. But when you start studying it, it's, yeah, we have reasons for literally every single thing we do. It's explained very well. <laughs> and you, we, we welcome the questions, you know, I mean, faith and reason are part of faith. faith. You know, we don't have to check our brain at the door. Um, but mm -hmm. a lot of these places, like that's, people are doing that. And I think it's, I think it's, um, they're searching, it's, it's emotional. Um, they're looking, they, and it feels good. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's not, a lot of this isn't on purpose. It might be some sort of, maybe an ignorance or a, you know, or they're just not, haven't been introduced to the truth or they had a bad experience. A lot of people had bad experiences at the church, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem. Um, Oh yeah. Well, and it seems very dissonant. I mean, there's, you're saying people are searching, they're seeking, they're looking for truth. Then they do these practices, which inevitably leads them to feelings of emptiness and nothingness and perhaps even nihilism. Mm -hmm. um, but they're looking for peace. They want to be free of their anxieties. And then they recognize maybe they have a moment where they go, go nothing actually matters uh, or it's whatever, or it's spiritual. It's fine but there's something more. I want more. Mm -hmm. It seems very, very cognitively dissonant. Um, yeah. it, it like, it, so like with palm reading or fortune telling or something like this, where you're trying to figure out what your future holds, but you've already established that nothing matters. So why yeah. do you care? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a, I, I don't think that's a, an unfair representation. I think it's just yeah. shows the, the cognitive dissonance. Like, what are you looking for? Yeah. Well, I think it shows too that no matter how much we we want to say like nothing matters or it's empty, like there's something within us. It's our nature as human beings. Like we're not going to be mm -hmm. satisfied with that. It's not going to satisfy us. And it feels like, oh, I'm going to have more peace if I have less responsibility and I don't have to be burdening myself with with relationships and I can just do what feels good, but it, that actually gives us less peace because mm. we're built to, to have these relationships. We're built to take something on. Um, I always find it interesting. I'm really, I really like to listen to world war two stories uh, be, just because of the, just people were did incredible things um, had such courage and went through so much. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of these men who fought in World War II, I mean, they talk about it like as if it's like the best thing they ever did, like the best time of their life in these. And you're like, how do they look at back at it in that way? And it's like because they were doing something that meant something like they were fighting for something. Mm -hmm. They were struggling for something. Um, and deep down, like that's what we want. We want to be giving ourselves and, and doing something that matters. And, and that's not going to go away, you know, and mm -hmm. our Lord, I mean, he called you know, pick up your cross and follow me, you know, I mean, he knows that this is what we we're called to that. And I, I know it's hard. I mean, I, I fall into it myself. Like some days I'm just like, oh, I just want to like get a cabin somewhere and be by myself. <laughs> you know, I have no responsibility, you know, but but I know like, that's not, that's not why we're here. We're not here just to hang out until we die. Like just doing things we like to do. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, that's not, that's not what we were made for. And we know, like, we know this inside. I think that's what, that's why you're, you're seeing that contradiction with people where it's just like, they're going after this supposed piece of, not having any responsibility, becoming nothing, but then they're seeking after these 
going to a psychic, finding out their future, grabbing a rock and thinking like, if I hold this, then something's going to happen, you know, or whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's, it's really interesting how, how there does seem to be a contradiction there, but, and, and we find more peace when we're giving of ourselves, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting. The world tells us something different for sure. (laughs) Well, that was, uh, that was St. John Paul II's favorite passage from, uh, Gaudium et Spes in Vatican II is, uh, paragraph 24, man only finds himself in a sincere gift of himself. Oh yeah. Um, that we, that we only really find meaning and fulfillment when we are connected with others. And it, it's like you said, it's communion, communion with God and communion with others who are in communion with God. I mean, that's, that's heaven. That's literally the definition of heaven is communion with God and communion with those in communion with him. And that's what we're all called to. And there's a, there's clearly a lot of work to do. There's a lot of opportunities and, um, you know, I think uh, I'm definitely going to name this episode. We're not called to hang out until we die. That's that's <laughs> definitely going to be the title. We're not just yeah. we're not just called to chill until we die. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, excellent. sacrifice. Well, I mean, we're we're really yeah are called sacrifice and humility, like you pointed out earlier. Um, and we're in such a comfortable. We're living in such a comfortable time that. Mm. I think it's in a sense, it's harder for us to, to understand that. It's like, well, I'll give in, until, you know, just to, but I'll still be comfortable, you know, <laughs> like I'll give you, I'll give you this much, but I'm going to keep this much. So I'm still comfortable. And we're really called to give until it hurts, you know, and we're called to be humble and vulnerable. And it's hard. It's hard uh, for me sometimes. Like I want to have this, I'm okay. Everything's fine. And, you know, and, and being comfortable, but it's no, we're meant, like you said, I mean, we're meant to be in the mess, uh, we're meant to be in this, the mess of the parish, the mess of relationships, the mess, you know, that's, that's, that's all the, that's where the good stuff is really. (laughs) It's something (laughs) we're, we're called to, we're called to, to muddle through it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ramey, any, uh, any final parting thoughts, parting words, where can people find out more about the parish and about the work you're doing there? Yes. Thanks for, thanks for saying that. Yeah. um, We are on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. The chapel can be found at Chapel Sedona and our parish, St. John Vianney Catholic church can be found at SJV Sedona. Um, Yeah. And we're updating it all the time. So it's a great way to stay connected to what's going on here, but also, help develop your faith. You know, we have great videos and homilies and, and just the beauty of Sedona too. So yeah, definitely check it out. Well, and I would definitely uh, echo that if you're in Sedona, if you're in Arizona, make a trip to Sedona, definitely go to the chapel of the Holy cross. It's, it is an international destination. People come there who aren't Catholic, uh, just to go there. I mean, I, I've yeah. seen that online, people it's talking about great. it on travel forums. Yeah. We always say, you know, uh, we were, we're told as Christians to bring the gospel to the world and the world comes to us here in Sedona. So <laughs> literally millions of people visit the chapel. Um, it's just a beautiful spot, people from all backgrounds, all beliefs. And it's just such an, a golden opportunity for us. Uh, that we're really trying to grasp. And yeah, go to chapeloftheholycross.com. We do have masses there twice a week. uh, And it's just a really beautiful experience. And and the church is at sjvsedona.org. And it's beautiful too. A lot of people don't, you know, they go to the chapel because it's famous, but the grounds of the parish (laughs) are just beautiful and huge. Uh, So yeah, we'd love to see (laughs) you. I'm going to have to make a drive up there. I've actually never been to the parish, so I'm going to have to check it out for sure. Yeah, it's gorgeous. (laughs) Awesome. Well, Ramey, thanks so much for your time, and thank you all for listening. Uh, Good Distinctions are the spice of life. If you haven't yet uh, subscribed to Good Distinctions, go to gooddistinctions.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at Good Distinctions and Facebook at Good Distinctions, and uh, send us an email at gooddistinctions at gmail.com. Love to hear from you if you have ideas for topics or would like anything in particular discussed. If you have 
any questions about anything that uh, we've talked about here, I'd be happy to pass that on to Ramey to get her thoughts and then publish it on the forum on Substack if you'd be okay with that, Ramey. Sure, yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for listening and uh, we'll see you next time on Good Distinctions. Good Distinctions are the spice of life. Thanks so much and God bless.